So my name is Joanna Cohn. I'm director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, and I want to welcome you all here for our monthly Innovations in Tobacco Control seminar series. Great to see so many faces today. And um, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Lisa Legacy. Uh, Lisa is pretty much born and bred Hopkins. Uh, she did her master's degree here, her PhD, and is now an assistant scientist with the Institute for Global Tobacco Control within the Department of Health behavior in society. So um, Lisa's background is in psychology and sociology, and she's been very interested in risk communication, health, um, health communications, adolescent health, and media. And um, obviously what she's going to share with us today sort of follows in, that, in those lines. She also, I'll just say, um, is a renowned teacher. She always gets great reviews in her courses and was just nominated by students for a teaching award within her department. So it's terrific, especially after teaching a course only for two years. Um, that's a huge accomplishment. Lisa's also a great mentor, and I think mentoring is sort of the, the gift that keeps giving because when, when you receive great mentorship, you're able to give it, and, and Lisa certainly does that. So um, really excited about the work that Dr. Legacy is going to be presenting today, just one of the pieces of a broad area of work that she's um, focusing on in terms of her, her program of research around tobacco industry, advertising, and promotion, um, both through uh, sort of traditional and, and so, traditional campaigns, social media, et cetera, but also um, doing work on communication of the tobacco pack and how people are um, perceiving those. So she won't, I don't think she'll talk about that today, but re I'm really pleased to have Lisa here today to talk about the work that she's done around um, Marlboro and Philip Morris's uh, internationals campaign in a couple of low and middle income countries. So Lisa, thanks for being here. Okay, should be on? Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you, Joanna, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for joining me today. I know especially for the students, this was a big ask to come out in the middle of your preparations for the end of the term. So I'm extra honored to present this work to you today. Um, so we'll be talking about Marlboro's new global image, which um, these taglines, smooth, timeless, and evolving, which the timeless and evolving may seem to contradict, but they're actually pulled from their um, newer campaigns, which you'll see in a few minutes. Um, oops. There we go. So I'd like to start today by talking about the global tobacco use burden. Then we'll move into talking a bit about how tobacco advertising contributes to that burden, particularly focusing on youth uptake and promotion of um, smoking and tobacco use among youth. Then we'll look at Marlboro's advertising more specifically and take a trip to Southeast Asia to see how um, Marlboro is influencing and appealing to youth in that context, and then hopefully take a you know, hopeful look toward the future as we consider the implications of, um, of Marlboro's activities and our research on those activities. So the global tobacco epidemic is affecting um, one billion smokers in, in our world. And if you think about, um, you know, the global context as a whole, that's about 20% of all adults. Um, we suffer 7 million deaths annually as a result of tobacco use, and by 2030, we can expect 8 million deaths annually. Um, and again, taking a holistic look at the globe, that's about 1 in 10 um, uh, tobacco-related deaths among adults each year. Um, and because we're in a school of public health, I think it's important to think about the broad range of health impacts that um, any health issue, but tobacco in this case, can can um, engender. So um, we have $1.4 trillion um, US in economic damages, and that's due to health care costs for tobacco-related illnesses, premature death, and lost productivity as well, so lost quality of life, thinking about that as a public health issue. 
issue. And tobacco farming and production is an environmental health issue. This is a fragile plant. It requires a lot of chemical input. And we um, have to remove a lot of forest land to farm this product. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, if we think about tobacco use, uh, again, with our public health lens, we can think about the social justice element. Um, we're pushing tobacco use into more and more marginalized sectors of society in the globe. 80% or more of the world's smokers are now residing in low and middle income countries, which you'll see on the slides from here on out, indicated as LMIC. Um, and we are seeing a, a trend of increasing use among um, folks in these countries due to population growth, but also um, aggressive industry marketing in these emerging areas, um, emerging markets. Um, and by 2030, we can estimate that 80% of tobacco-related deaths will um, be concentrated in low- and middle-income countries. Um, so thinking about youth as the new market for these companies, um, we have about 25 million youth ages 13 to 15, so pretty young, um, smoking cigarettes. And just as the um, you know, general population of smokers is increasing in LMICs, um, youth tobacco use is increasing in particular. And we're seeing in some countries that the prevalence of youth smoking is actually higher than adults. And this is particularly true for women and girls, where historically the prevalence rates have been lower for that, those populations. So we may expect some changes in that kind of historical trend over time. Um, and youth smoking really matters, because the younger a person starts, the earlier they initiate, the higher risk they have for addiction, a certainly longer duration of use, and then um, associated morbi morbidity and mortality. And tobacco marketing is really a key factor in why youth um, pick up this behavior. Um, so tobacco advertising uses innovative strategies. It's one of the most innovative uh, product mar products marketed. Um, and the goal is to foster positive attitudes, beliefs, and expectations about tobacco use. Um, and it's really a key element in shaping our brand preferences and um, maintaining those preferences over time. And um, the themes that to tobacco um, companies use to market their products include social approval, autonomy, adventure, wealth, and luxury. And these are arguably all key concerns to adolescents in particular. And it's important to note that tobacco companies will publicly say that they're not directly targeting youth, but we have decades of research reviews, and industry documents that contradict this public presence. <clears throat> so let's take a look at Marlboro, which is the, the world's largest cigarette brand. Um, this is the most recognized and largest selling brand of cigarettes in the world, and it's the flagship brand of Philip Morris. So um, it's a US-based brand, um, Philip Morris USA. Um, which is now a branch of Altria, um, and marketed and distributed by Philip Morris International outside of the US, um, so separate entities. Um, just to give you some history of the, the market presence, um, the um, brand was launched here in 1924, and it was marketed as kind of a luxury cigarette at the time. In the late 20s early, and through the 30s, um, it became advertised more as a women's cigarette with taglines saying mild as may, as you can see on the far left, um, and beauty tips. They had red filter tips to mask lipstick stains. Um, in the 1950s, uh, the company repositioned the cigarette as a men's cigarette with a focus on the filter. This is when our first um, really public research was coming out about the, the harms of smoking. Um, so the, the idea was, oh, if we promote the filter, it'll seem as, as a less harmful product than using an unfiltered cigarette. And this is when the Marlboro Man emerges. And, um, 
we think of the Marlboro Man, probably all of you as a cowboy, but really at the advent of this rebranding of Marlboro, it was a general kind of everyday man in different contexts. The, um, the cowboy being the most um, effective and popular of those. So in the 1960s, um, the brand extended um, its marketing to the Marlboro Cowboy specifically and Marlboro Country, um, which you can see on the far right. Um, so Marlboro has a global presence. As I mentioned, it's the largest selling cigarette in the world. In the 1950s is when we first see the company move outside the US with their first sales operations and um, production facilities. And now the, the brand is located in 56 countries and growing and is sold in more than 180 countries. Um, and by 1972, it's the top selling brand in the world and it still ranks among the top 25 most valuable global brands. So, um, you know, for considering stocks and investments. Um, that's a very, um, and, and the competition for um, um, resources there, that's a very high ranking. <clears throat> so the Marlboro Man and Marlboro Country have been a, a really strong global presence for decades. And we, what we saw was in 20, 2008, um, Philip Morris International decided to shift their gears to reinvigorate their market presence um, abroad. And they launched a new global brand architecture, which they refer to in their industry documents as Architecture 2.0. Um, in 2012, they, their PMI um, did a big um, ad push um, with at least $62 million um, focused on launching new brands within their Marlboro line and rolling out innovative and aggressive new campaigns, which we'll take a look at over the next few slides. And the, the objective is really to expand their marketplace and target untapped consumers and customers. Um, and they're doing this by, these are from, this language is from their um, documents, anticipating emerging trends and tastes, aiming for a minimalistic and unisex style, so something that can kind of appeal to everyone um, in, in their argument, um, modernizing their communication platforms to reach a broader audience, and communicating an environmental friendly message. Um, so these are some of the um, products and campaigns pulled from um, across the world as part of this new brand architecture. Um, so we have the continued, I don't know if I won't touch that, the continued focus on Marlboro Red as their timeless brand presence. Um, and then some of the newer, um, um, like more evocative feelings of smoothness and flavor and um, adventure. So they're using new pack designs to achieve this rebranding strategy. Um, again, these words are from their documents, focusing on new taste dimensions, so flavors and um, kind of the chemosensory elements, new filter designs. You can see in the pack highlighted on the far right the, um, the pr very prominent capsules on the filters, new products, and new advertising campaigns. Um, there's also a kind of a global push from red to black in packaging and marketing. Um, so they have their three brand kind of broader families of red, gold, and fresh, but all appearing in these black packages in, um, in certain markets. Um, and the Architecture 2.0 introduced this as a means of communicating status, prestige, sophistication, and authority. Um, and thinking back to those themes that I discussed earlier around broader tobacco advertising goals, these are really themes that, that resonate with younger people um, who are looking to position themselves in a more kind of authoritative and unique context. Um, and along with these new products and packaging, we have reinvigorated marketing, which focuses on freedom and authenticity, confidence, leadership, decisiveness, all of which were wrapped up in the Marlboro Man, but are now kind of being repackaged and re-presented to the global audience in a more you know, 21st century way. So um, the flagship kind of um, campaign to 
launched this reinvigor reinvigorated strategy was titled Be Marlboro, uh, which is really the global push to replace the Marlboro Man. And it's the cornerstone of Marlboro's new brand architecture. So it urges young people to be Marlboro smokers, um, drawing on those youth-oriented themes and messages that we had talked about. Um, focusing on young people kind of partying, falling in love, just generally being like cool and having a really awesome time. And the top um, two images are the, the like first run of Be Marlboro. So just to read them out, um, a maybe has no fun. Don't be a maybe, be a Marlboro. Maybe never fell in love. These are just two treatments of the Be Marlboro campaign. And then we see on the bottom ext expansion and extension of Be Marlboro into other taglines like crossover, be the dream, be Marlboro, crossover. Are you ready to act? You decide. This was an additional tagline, so you decide. Um, so we see the same kind of themes, but with different tagline treatments attached to them. So from here, you know, we have the kind of big picture of what Marlboro has looked like and is looking like now. I'd like to spend some time talking about two studies that I conducted with colleagues um, here examining B. Marlboro Architecture 2.0 advertising in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> so why Southeast Asia? Why? Um, well, just to start, we picked two countries in Southeast Asia. We didn't cover the entire um, swath of that globe. Um, Philippines and Indonesia are key markets for tobacco companies. So if we think back to those earlier slides about our emerging trends in use, um, you know, areas for tobacco companies to develop their market base, um, the, these two countries are ripe for growth. So starting um, with Indonesia, um, we have the largest prevalence of male um, tobacco users, smokers in the world. So there's already a very large um, prevalence of use with 17, or 74% of older adult, uh, adolescents, 15 to 18 years old, already using um, cigarettes. And there's, so there's opportunity to grow that market share into younger demographics. It's also um, an, an opportunity to expand um, female uptake of cigarettes. So there's only about a 3% prevalence of smoking among adolescent girls in this context. So we have the, they have the opportunity to really expand their brand pre prevalence um, presence there. In the Philippines, about a quarter of youth um, report ever smoking. But we, our recent, um, the, the recent um, survey of youth in that country found that one in about one in nine kids report an intention to try smoking in the, the coming 30 days. So again, we see opportunity for expansion of the marketplace there. Um, and the tobacco companies are very aware of this, spending hundreds of millions of dollars of marketing investment in these two countries alone to really aggressively promote their products. <clears throat> Okay, um, so we also have to understand the context of tobacco promotion rules and regulations in uh, Philippines and Indonesia. I'm going to start with Indonesia and then Philippines because I realize that I present my findings as Indonesia, Philippines, so just bear with me on the slide here. Um, so compared to other countries, Indonesia has a fairly um, limited span of restrictions on tobacco advertising. It's really the tobacco companies are allowed to advertise on most media platforms, <laughs> although there are some jurisdictional differences, particularly around outdoor billboards. Um, but, but generally, um, radio, TV, billboards, point of sale are all permissible avenues to um, market um, tobacco in Indonesia. In the lower um, quadrant here, you see a uh, Marlboro Black Menthol, which is a new product that's marketed on a overpass billboard in Indonesia, um, in Jakarta. Um, and there are, as I mentioned, television ads are, are permitted, but there is a limited restriction that they can only be aired after 9 p.m. I would argue that that's a very weak limitation um, given the, you know, that's when most people are relaxing and watching TV, but just to kind of put that 
in context that there is some restriction placed on that. In the Philippines, there's a bit stronger regulation. Um, there's prohibitions on explicit tobacco marketing across most media. However, um, tobacco promotion, including B. Marlboro, is legally present at the point of sale and out in and outdoor venues. So venues that children are certainly um, frequenting and is visible high traffic areas. Um, so. To dive into our study, the objective was the same in both contexts, which was to examine the influence and appeal of Marlboro advertising, um, which we compared to a local cigarette brand on intentions to smoke among youth. Um, we took a mixed methods approach. The first component was a self-administered survey, which measured um, um, intention to smoke as our outcome with identification, likability, and perceived effectiveness of our selected advertisements. And then the focus group component allowed us to really get into like the why and how of the appeal. Um, so we examined how young people interpret and respond to um, our selected ads. Um, we asked questions around, um, you know, who are the target audience? What's attractive about this ad? Um, um, what don't you like? So we could really dive into to the, um, the findings that we were getting from the surveys. Our participants were Filipino and Indonesian youth residing in um, Manila and Jakarta respectively, ages 13 to 17 years old. This is an important age range because uh, initiation and experimentation is common um, during this uh, across this stage of adolescence. So we wanted to capture before they're really established smokers, you know, what are their um, responses to these campaigns. For the survey, we used a quota-based sampling method to ensure that we had adequate representation of uh, socioeconomic status, sex, and smoking status represented in our sample. This is particularly important in these contexts where there's low proportions, um, particularly of female smokers. So um, we wanted to make sure that we had adequate representation. And we recruited at, for both um, the focus groups and the surveys at the household level. So we used a structured household skipping protocol that was adapted to each city context um, that uh, reflected the housing stock in the different areas. Um, and for the survey participants, they were able to take the survey right at the time of recruitment. And for focus group participants, they were scheduled at the time of recruitment and then participated you know, at a later date, just to give a sense for what the recruitment looked like. Our analysis um, included multivariable logistic regression um, of the survey data to evaluate the influence of ad appeal on, our, on the kids' reported intention to smoke. And we conducted thematic analysis to examine, again, the why and how youth um, interpreted and responded to the ads. <clears throat> so our ad selection um, in Indonesia um, were two television ads. So let me just back up for a second to say that um, in Indonesia, Kretex or clove cigarettes are really the leading product, combustible tobacco product, um, in terms of market popularity. Um, so we compared TV ads for Marlboro Filter Black to the Jarum um, Black um, series, Jarum Super Mild Black series, which um, these were two new products launched at the same time. Marlboro Filter Black is Marlboro's first um, what they call machine rolled Kretex cigarette that was commercially available in Indonesia, so versus a hand rolled product. And Jarum is the leading um, brand, like local national brand um, that is a special, specializes in Kretex cigarettes. Just to give a sense for what these look like, the Marlboro Filter Black ad is a very tech kind of focused ad with swooshing, this red line swooshes across the screen and is really highlighting the, the smooth taste and the filter as a, like a technological element. Um, and there's also a lot of focus in that ad on the pack being um, like a cool pack design that really protects your cigarettes. The Jarum um, Black series is um, the same color scheme, so this red and black, uh, again with a swooshing red line, but it features dancing, um, um, so like models dancing to a 
local like form of music. So just to give a sense for what they look like and feel like. Um, so similarity in terms of the color scheme and the, the movement, but differences in the focus of the product. Um, in the Philippines, again, um, billboards and point of sale ads are the predominant form of marketing there. Um, so we pulled um, billboards and point of sale ads from Marlboro. Um, they had two treatments of B Marlboro running at the time, so the top says Maybe I will get there, don't be a maybe, be a Marlboro. And the um, bottom is a, their crossover campaign that I just launched at the time, um, Marlboro Crossover. Um, I should note that crossover, um, while they have a billboard point of sale, um, you know, the same kind of marketing presence that traditional, you know, the, rest, the other B Marlboro and other ads have, there's this um, additional promotional element that that crossover is um, uniquely contained. So there's, um, you know, product like products that you can sign up to receive, like watches that have the Marlboro white and red, um, or vacation sweepstakes, things like that. So crossover is a bit of a different treatment than the Marlboro. It's an extension. Um, and then these are the two ads from the local brand Mighty, which at the time was the competitive um, brand. So you can get a feel for um, the differences there. So starting with Indonesia with the survey findings, we had 806 kids participate and we had about equal proportion of um, girls and boys because of our, uh, the way we had set our quotas. 43% um, of our respondents uh, reported an intention to smoke in the coming year. Um, and when we asked participate, participants to rate Marlboro and Jaru, they um, actually did rate Jaru higher than Marlboro across the three measures of appeal. So when we get into the focus group findings, it'll be important to keep that in mind. Um, and but odds of intention to smoke um, did increase with liking of either condition, so Marlboro and Jaru, um, but we saw um, higher odds of intention to smoke with greater reported liking of the ads, which is you know, what we would expect to find um, consistent with the rest of the literature. But let's dive into what the kids actually saw in these ads. I don't know that our measures of appeal alone can really capture what the, the ads were telling, what we're speaking to the kids. So um, just in general, the focus group participants described the similarity in the ad presence. So they remarked on how similar the two companies looked in their presentation, but they were able to tease out different messages. So like thinking about each brand in a broader context. Marlboro was seen as a foreign product, not of Indonesia. So this quote on the left, it's a product from abroad compared to Jarum is of the natives here. So there was a distinction in the origin of the product. Marlboro was also positioned as a luxury product, whereas Jarum is like the product for the everyday person. So it's usually an upper class, speaking about Marlboro, it's usually upper class people who like them, whereas Jarum is for ordinary classes, ordinary people. So we're seeing that distinction if you think about the ad within the context of the larger marketing effort. And importantly, um, there were distinctions between the two brands for between youth and adults. So um, one participant described Marlboro as being um, mostly those who smoke them are young kids. So there's that already that distinction versus Jarum. Maybe most of them are older men who smoke them. So we're seeing a difference in target audience um, for the brand themselves. Um, and then it's important to note that the actual medium was important here. Um, for both ads, the kids talked about liking the music and dancing for Jarum. They talked about liking the video element. Um, and they also recognized or perceived that they were being manipulated by both companies. So the horrible part is that little children will give it a try. Uh, was one participant's description of the marketing in general. Um, and then talking about it's forbidden, meaning smoking is forbidden, but they, it's still advertised. 
which we can argue is kind of a, an important and compelling um, advertising message in itself. So we know that young people are drawn to things that they are, you know, is forbidden to them. But the, so there's this awareness that, well, we're not supposed to use it, but still being advertised to us. So in the Philippines, our findings were um, slightly different for the surveys. In this context, um, Marlboro ads were consistently rated more appealing than those for Mighty across our three measures of appeal, um, liking, identification, and perceived effectiveness. Um, and the influence of Marlboro ads on youth intention to smoke differed by smoking status in some important ways. For never and former smokers, so youth who had never tried cigarettes and youth who had tried but were not, had not currently, um, liking the Marlboro ads nearly doubled their odds of intention to smoke. Um, so um, we have the odds ratios listed here of 1.94 and 2.24 respectively. And for current and former smokers, so um, kids with um, active and, and, um, and past experience with the product, it was really only the higher perceived effectiveness of the ads that was associated with increased intention to smoke. Um, so, you know, if they thought the ad was compelling and what made them want to try or buy the product, they were more likely to report an increased intention to smoke. And we saw no significant effects on ad appeal and intention to smoke for the mighty conditions. So to dive into the focus group findings here, um, Marlboro ads were, uh, and Mighty ads were not described in the same, you know, as having the same characteristics, you know, thinking about Indonesia where they looked very similar. Here we can see that they distinctly do not look similar. So we didn't have the, the discussion around the similarity of the presentation. Instead, Marlboro was described um, as promoting adventure and decisiveness. When they were asked, you know, what does this ad promote, they used the word adventure in some, in, uh, some contexts. Um, Mighty ads were perceived as being more for adult smokers, in specifically. Um, and when they were asked what the ad promotes, they used terms more like um, you feel relaxed. It was more um, in terms of stress relief compared to the adventure kind of messaging for Marlboro. Um, importantly, um, just as in Indonesia, young people really saw themselves as the target um, of Marlboro advertising, whereas they did not see themselves in mighty advertising. So they referred to many young people, for, uh, to pull out one quote, as responding to Marlboro advertisements. Um, again, as with Indonesia, we have this awareness of, on the part of children that the ads are manipulating them. And they, while they liked the ads themselves, there was discussion about how the product of cigarettes was unappealing. So um, here's one quote in the middle here that the ad is nice, but it's not good for our health. So cigarettes are not good for, for the health. So there's that awareness in both contexts. So to bring both, um, both countries together, um, Marlboro ads, just to sum up, were rated as more appealing than the local brand in the Philippines, but there was less of that distinction in the survey findings in Indonesia. Um, liking Marlboro ads in, in Indonesia, the comparison brand as well, was associated with increased odds of intention to smoke, particularly among non-smoking youth. And this is consistent with what we see in the literature more broadly. Um, if we think back to the earlier slides about what Marlboro, how Marlboro has positioned itself historically and how it's moving um, into the 21st century, the kids really identified the themes that Marlboro wanted them, that PMI wants them to see. So they talked about themes of luxury with the filter black products, so really feeling like it's an elegant, luxurious product, an adventure with the Marlboro, um, really reflecting the treatment um, from at the, at the brand level. Marlboro was perceived in both contexts as a brand for youth, whereas the local brands were seen as more accessible, both in terms of like, my uncle smokes this, um, but also in terms of just, it's not a luxury, it's distinct in that way. 
Um, and importantly, while participants described liking Marlboro, they were wary of cigarette advertising in general. So this could be something to leverage in the future. Um, so moving forward, um, our findings support kind of growing concerns regarding the influence of Marlboro marketing in emerging markets. So if we think about youth as an emerging market writ large, and if we think about low and middle income countries as a more specific emerging market, we definitely see that there's influence and appeal in those contexts. And there's value in extending and strengthening restrictions on tobacco advertising. Um, so in the Philippines, there's fairly robust restrictions, but there's room for improvement um, with limiting um, the outdoor presence and, and point of sale presence. Um, and certainly in Indonesia, we have a lot of room for improvement um, for um, limiting and restricting tobacco promotion across media contexts. So um, extending and strengthening restrictions, not only in the form of the tactics that are used, so the, pr the placement and the methods used to reach um, youth and other um, audiences, but the content as well. So what can be said about the product and, and how. Um, and I think you know, these findings are hopeful in some way. As I mentioned, tobacco control efforts could build on young people's growing and or continuing awareness about the manipulative nature of marketing um, and integrate media literacy um, efforts, health, public health education, and policy all together um, to explicitly counter the positive um, images of smoking that um, really powerful brands like Marlboro are presenting to our global youth. And I don't know if my, I wanted to leave it in the kids' hands, but sorry guys, I should have. I think we can do this one. Um, this work, what, hold on. Um, we, our colleague, is this is showing up? No. How do I, are you seeing it? Hmm? Ah, thank you. Okay, so this um, work was conducted um, in collab, or this video is a collaboration between um, uh, researcher at Johns Hopkins at the time and the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids to get kids' impressions of B. Marlboro in the Philippines. And I think it's important to hear from their voices um, as we launch into our own discussion what they think of this campaign. I love her. I know. <laughs> we need to hire her. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to, uh, while I was not involved in that, 
sorry. In my in that work myself, I think it's a a good reflection of what we heard in our focus groups as well. Um, the recognition of the powerful presence of this brand and the um, impacts it can have on kids' lives moving forward. And with that, I'd like to close with some additional, um, I know I said I'd close with the kids' comments, but I do want to acknowledge my colleagues. We are funding from the Bloomberg Initiative to Reduce Tobacco Use, and my mentor and co-author, Joanna Cohen, um, and Morella Minosa and Megan Mar uh, Moran, who are also here. And our, the data collection and recruitment were carried out in uh, Manila by Good Thinking Research, led by Ferdi Frejas, and the University of Indonesia in Jakarta um, Center for Health Research, led by Dr. Rita Damianti. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. to the beginning. Thank you for the fantastic presentation and really interesting <laughs> research. Um, so I was wondering, when you see that the young people are attracted to the Marlboro S, were there any comments in the focus group or otherwise where they specifically talked about like what in the ads was so appealing to them? Like was it the promotions or? the cool colors? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it was more, or what we saw was more the general feeling and the taglines were important. So um, there, I don't know if I, I can't see it on this screen. Let me see if I can. I want to go back to what the ads looked like. Can you see that? No. Um, well, so one of the ads in, the, in Manila, was saying, um, you decide. So how far will you go? You decide. And just to pull that line out as an example, kids really responded to that saying, in so many areas of my life, I'm told what to do. I have to do my homework for my teachers. I'm told what I can wear and eat by my parents. And this ad is telling me that I get to decide something that's really compelling and cool. Um, and um, so it wasn't at, like, it, in Indonesia, there was response to the, the colors and the feeling. But again, it was really like the, the taglines that were being used. So, um, you know, the, the, the notion of mild in that context was really important. And the black um, seemed, you know, luxurious and it for both. So both ads looked really similar in that context. But um, so there's a combination of the taglines and the colors that were, that were used. Um, and in comparison, what was less appealing for Mighty was the imagery. So they talked about it really being like, as I said, for stress relief and relaxation. One focus group participant really made this beautiful vignette where he was talking about um, a call center worker, which is very common form of employment there and they're working in the middle of the night to service our calls during our daytime. And he's saying, you know, I just imagine my uncle who's a call center worker and he's ground, ground down and he goes out and this is like this relaxing sunset and Mighty is his chance to kind of step away for a minute versus the adventure and fun of the Marlboro ad. So I like that vignette a lot. Thanks, Lisa. That was really great. Um, so you said that there was some awareness that like this is manipulation from the industry, mm -hmm. like that they're aware that these ads are trying to get them to start smoking. But especially this Marlboro crossover ad that's asking like you decide, like you said people like that it was giving them that sense of freedom or like autonomy. But it's very ironic given <laughs> like the addictive nature of smoking. Was there like awareness of that deeper level of these like slogans and taglines and how they weren't? Yeah, that's another great question. So is there, was there discussion of sort of the discordance between the presentation of the brand and the actual effects? Does that sum up your question? 
So not to that level of depth. I think there's the, um, the discussion was more around, we know it's bad for your health, so they shouldn't be advertising it to us. It wasn't so much, well, they're telling us we decide, but then we're you know addicted and do you really have the decision? It wasn't to that level um, of, of um, at least, of articulated awareness that doesn't maybe there was some of that one thing i didn't discuss in the broader presentation is that we compared cigarettes um, to other consumer products that are attractive to you so cell phone companies food products clothing and in, in each market and there was no discussion of manipulation for ads for those products which they're still being manipulated ads are manipulating no matter what but it was really this notion of cigarettes being the bad product. So um, I think there there's future research opportunities there to unpack what's really being said. Is it just that we know we should say cigarettes are bad, or do we actually really like feel this in at a deeper level as you're um, insinuating? Yeah, Lori. I think you have to wait for this. Okay. So um, in some of these ads, like it's often people featured with other people, like you featured mm -hmm. with other youth. So I was wondering, like in your quali her quantitative data, you were able to kind of look at some of uh, the possibly mediating effects of like having other, um, like people in your peer groups who smoke or who, um, um, if there was any like sort of associations that you might have found with people's susceptibility and also okay. being mediated by That's a different, people. I thought you were going to go more in the people featured in the ads, but we did ask questions about social norms, um, both, you know, subjunctive, injunctive social norms and, um, you know, family members and friends who smoke. And there, I'm looking to Morella because she probably remembers the nuances of the analyses a little bit better, but there was, um, we didn't observe an effect at that level. At the univariate um, level, yes. But once we started, since our interest were, were the appeals, once they were added into that, it started to, the significance started to dampen a little bit. Thank Lisa, you. can you repeat that for me? Yeah. So at the univari univariate level, yeah, there were some effects of um, peer, as you mentioned, peer and, um, and family members smoking. But when they were added into the model in our multivariable um, analyses, the effect disappeared or was less Yeah, Jeff? Or Jeff, okay. I'll go ahead first. Uh -huh. um, so this is great. and I alluded at the very beginning to doing some work, some additional work with PACs. Mm -hmm. And I know you've just concluded some focus groups with young people, uh, maybe not as young as, as in these studies. I don't know if you've been, I know like it was just happening yesterday, some of your focus groups, but if you have a sense, I think one of the things you've told me about how young people here are thinking about the attractiveness of PACs which is an extension of the advertising, is that they're seeing certain things as for younger people. Yes. And, and even young, very young adults are mm -hmm. feeling more established and some of these gimmicks may not be for them. Do you, have you had a chance, and maybe not, to think about some of these ads and like, is your, are you getting a sense that the Marlboro um, architecture 2.0 is really trying to get at the youngest people or might be attractive to even young adults? Yeah, no, of course I've been thinking a lot about that. That's a great question. I'm going back to um, these slides about the tactics and strategies. I will say that, we'll, so just to provide some context to what Dr. Cohen had asked. We were conducting focus groups with 18 to 24 year old um, men and women here in Baltimore City, um, with smokers and non-smokers in, in each um, group. Um, and looking at Marlboro and other, uh, a wide variety of brand packs. But focusing in on what was said about Marlboro is there's really um, 
a recitation, particularly of this line, about minimalistic and unisex appeal. So just to give you a sense, the packs have, um, some have lots of colors. There's that black focus on black packs. Um, and Marlboro packs, whether they be black or white, um, are really standing out as appealing to kids because uh, they talk about, I'm a minimalist, I like clean design. So this minimalistic um, virtue is really being communicated through the packs and the idea that anyone would be attracted. So the unisex appeal as well when we ask about, you know, tell me who, who would have this pack out in their, um, you know, if they're out and about, um, they're seeing men and women, girls and boys. Um, and the more flashy packs, so um, let me just pull up the pack image. So um, a pack like this, um, young adults are explicitly excluding themselves from this target audience, like this, oh, like, I, we heard the term 13-year-old boy come up in each group. Like this would be for a 13-year-old boy, the packs that are really like, explosive colors. Whereas our old, this, you know, our, our participants were 18 to 24, they're seeing themselves more in this classic range. So um, the, the clean, minimalist packs are more attractive to them. So while we haven't yet, we will be talking with 13, 17-year-olds there is some possibility that they too would see them, explicitly see themselves as part of this demographic where the 18 to 24 adults did not. Yeah. Is there time for Jeff's question? Thank you, so my question is actually an extension of that um, in a way. So do we know in response to these ad campaigns and these changes in packs, like how market share among these, uh, this age group changes over time? I know it's a big, I don't big ask. Know the I was just wondering that. if you knew. No, that's a great question, and maybe you know that's certainly an opportunity for further inquiry. But I haven't looked at the market share values. Yeah. You're getting your exercise. This is. <laughs> So you know, I'm an intervention person. I'm always interested in you know, what can we do with this. And yeah. um, I think some of your some of your results um, really suggest that there is opportunity for intervention. That there is some recognition uh, among kids that they're being manipulated. And um, so it's just curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, kind of comparing this to what happened in the U.S. with um, the Truth Campaign, mm -hmm. that the first iteration of the Truth Campaign, which was really the most successful um, media. Um, counter marketing campaign. Um, is there an opportunity to use this in places like Indonesia um, and, and the Philippines? And are there players there who would be interested in pushing something like that? So I certainly think so. Um, there are counter marketing campaigns, that, and I don't have images of them, but that tagline of maybe, um, don't be a maybe, um, has been um, flipped around to um, um, basically like maybe never got lung cancer, or maybe mm -hmm. never, you know, to, to show that, um, that the, to really like expose the manipulative elements and instead of, they, they use the same um, imagery, but like, um, may, you know, imagine like jumping off of a cliff instead of jumping into a fun empty pool. Um, so there, there are, um, yeah, there are um, groups that are doing that work, and I think certainly I don't have the evaluation data for for wh how effective those counter marketing campaigns have been. Um, the you decide um, tagline has also been flipped around um, to say you die, crossing out the the extraneous letters or suicide. Um, so there are, you can, you, there is evidence of count, explicit counter marketing, and I'm sure, you know, working with um, local advocate groups, that that could be powerful in, in those um, specific contexts as well. But I don't have the evaluation data for those, yeah. Okay. Oh, there's one. Oh. 
Did you have a question? Or am I, okay, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you had your hand. No, no, it is a simple question. Uh, did you look at uh, the um, impact of price? On That's whether a great question. Um, so we, one of the ads did explicitly feed, the one Marlboro ad, yeah, they did explicitly include the, um, in that in their copy, the three um, pesos per stick. So that was discussed a bit as um, you know, as an attractive element. It's fairly expensive for a per stick pack in that context. Um, but we did tell the groups to pretend like the um, brands were the same price so that they could kind of remove that from their um, evaluation of the, of the ads. But that, that's certainly a relevant consideration. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing this sort of multi-country, mixed methods study, very ambitious, and, um, and doing it so well. So fantastic talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joanne.